Okay, so lesson five in calculus one. And we have the function f of x is minus one over x minus four. And we want to find the limit as x approaches four of this function. Yes. Yes. Um, so what does the graph of this function look like? The problem, of course, is as x approaches four, the denominator is going to zero. And so this is the limit as x approaches four. And maybe it's a little bit easier to see if you write minus one over x minus four is plus one over four minus x. So the limit of f of x as x approaches four from the right, this means when x is bigger than four. If x is bigger than four, this is negative. Um, so that means this is negative and the denominator is going to zero. So this is going to minus infinity. But if you take the limit of f of x, as x approaches four from the left, that's when x is less than four, this is positive. And the limit is plus infinity. So this limit is plus infinity. So for this function, you have to look separately at the limits from the right and the limits from the left. So this is the graph of the function. It's this, what's called a rectangular hyperbola. And when x is bigger than four, this function is negative. So it's always below the x-axis and it's going to negative infinity. But from the left, this function is positive. X is less than four. This is going to plus infinity. So that's what's going on. Does that answer your question? Um, yes, sir. Um, I have one more, please. Okay. Uh, this is also a rational function, please. Okay. Um, f of x equals x plus two. Mm -hmm. Dividing x squared minus x minus six. Okay. So did I write it down correctly? Yes, sir, that's correct. It says, which of the, it says, uh, find the values, if any, at which f is not continuous, and which of the discontinuous are removable. Okay, so you can factor x squared minus x minus six into x minus three times x plus two. Yeah. So this is, so this function is, not continuous wherever the denominator is zero at x equal three and x equal to negative two, right? Well, on the other hand, when x is, no, x is different from three or different from negative two, we can always write this as x minus three over x plus two the x plus twos cancel. So this function is the same as one over x minus three for x not equal to three or negative two. And the limit of, of f of x as x approaches negative two is one over minus two minus three, or minus <clears throat> one fifth. So x equal negative two, the limit of this function exists. So x equal negative two is a removable discontinuity. If we simply redefine the function at negative two to have the value minus a fifth, 
the function, the new function will be continuous. On the other hand, the limit of f of x as x approaches three, even if you write it like this, this still does not exist. So x equal three is not a removable discontinuity. Thank you. Okay. Does anyone else have a question? Anything else? Any questions on the homework problems on limits? Section 2.3, limits in the squeeze theorem. If not, then we will talk about continuity. So this is section 2.4. Continuity. We want to have an understanding of this notion of what it means to have a continuous function. And the simple way to understand this is a function's continuous if you could draw its graph with your pencil on the paper and never taking the pencil off. You can have corners, but you can just draw this thing in one continuous motion. That's what it means to be continuous. So this function is continuous. If you have a function that looks like this, goes up and then there's a jump, in this case a jump down, this function is discontinuous. So most of the nice functions that you know and love are continuous. An important function which is not continuous is we have the function f of x, which is notated like this in our textbook. So what is the value of this function at x? This is equal to the largest integer, the largest whole number, less than or equal to x. So if x equal n is an integer, then f of x, this is sometimes called the integer part, the integer part of x, that's just the integer part of n. The integer part of an integer is n. And if x is between two integers, then, the integer part of x is again, the largest integer less than or equal to x is n. So if x, for example, is greater than or equal to zero and strictly less than one, then the integer part of x is zero. If x is greater than or equal to one and less than two, then the integer part of x is one. If we were to graph this function, from zero up to, but not including one, the function is zero. From one up to, but not including two, the function is equal to two. If x is greater than or equal to two, and less than three, then the largest integer less than or equal to x is two. And so on. What about if x is negative? If x is less than zero and greater than or equal to one, 
then the integer part of x is minus 1. If x is less than minus 1, but greater than or equal to 2, minus 2, the integer part of x is minus 2. And so forth. So if you have to answer the question, compute the integer part of minus 3.6, what's the biggest integer less than or equal to minus 3.6? Well, you say minus 3.6, that's between minus 4 and minus 3. Minus 4 is less than minus 3. The biggest integer less than or equal to minus 3.6. It's not minus 3, it's minus 4. So this function is a, sometimes called a step function because it's up and then steps up, steps up, steps up, steps up. This function is continuous for x not equal to an integer and it's discontinuous for whenever x is an integer. Because as you go from here to here, you have to jump. You have to take your pencil off the paper. It jumps up. Okay. So a good way to understand a continuous function is to make sure you understand examples of functions that are not continuous. OK? Any questions about this? So of course, there's a formal definition of continuity, which says rigorously exactly everything that I just explained intuitively. So the function at y equals f of x is continuous at the point C. All right, so C is some number if the following three conditions are satisfied. First of all, F of C is defined. So C is in the domain of definition of the function. And there's some number F of C. Second, if you take the limit of F of X, as x approaches c from the right or the left, this limit exists. And third, the value of that limit is exactly the value of the function at c. So a function is continuous at a point if it satisfies these three conditions. And we say, f of x is continuous on an interval i, an open interval. So f of x is continuous on an open interval i if f of x is continuous in every point c in the interval. Okay. So let's look at some examples. What about the nice function f of x equals 1 over x? That's the graph of the function. This function is not defined at x equals 0. Right? Just not, I mean, you can't take 1 over 0. So, but this function, f of x equal 1 over x, is continuous 
for all x not zero. So f of x equal one over x is continuous on the interval i, the open interval from zero to infinity, and on the other open interval from minus infinity to zero. So at zero, it's not defined. But on this infinite interval, open interval, doesn't include zero, from zero to infinity, <coughs> the function is continuous. And on this open interval, from minus infinity to zero, the function also is continuous. Other questions? So this is really review because I talked about this last week. Um, but it's important to understand these things, all right? Okay? Sometimes it's useful to talk about when a function is continuous on a closed interval. So here we're talking about an open interval. So we say that f of x is continuous on the closed interval from a to b. So on the number line, we have A, we have B, and it's the whole interval, including the endpoints. So first, it has to be continuous on the interior on, so F of X is continuous on the open interval from A to B, and at the endpoints, well, what about A? We can only take the limit, I mean, if F of X we can assume or suppose f of x is defined at a, but it's not necessarily defined for numbers less than a. So we can take the limit as x approaches a from the right, and that limit should be the value of the function at a. So f of a is defined, the limit from the right exists, and the limit is equal to the value of the function. And similarly, as you approach b from the left, the limit as x approaches b from the left, that's the minus sign, is the value of the function at b. And one extremely useful fact about continuous functions is a result called the intermediate value theorem. So the intermediate value theorem for continuous functions on, that is for functions that are continuous. So for continuous function f on the closed interval from a to b. So here on the number line, we have a and we have b. And let's say this is f of a and this is f of b, and the function is continuous. So you can think of it this as like we go from here to here, 
the graph of the function. And we don't have to take our pencil off the paper. Suppose f of a is less than f of b, and we take some number k that's in between them. So here is some number k between f of a and f of b. And the intermediate value theorem says there's some number c where f of c is equal to k. There exists a number c between a and b such that f at c is equal to k. So between a and b, if you take any number between f of a and f of b, that's the value of the function of some number say c between a and b. So this is the picture in the case that f of a is less than f of b. If f of a is bigger than f of b, the same result holds, only in this case, say this is a, this is b, this is f of a, this is f of b. The function somehow goes from f of a to f of b. And if you take any number k between these two numbers, there's always a number c between a and b where f of a, f of c equals k. So if f of a is less than f of b, and if k is a number which is bigger than f of b and less than f of a, there exists a number c in the open interval from a to b. This notation just means in. Such that f of c is equal to k. Right. Let me do, this was not one of the homework problems, but let's look at a problem that involves the intermediate value theorem. So in section 2.4, exercise 103 says, consider the function f of x equals this parabola x squared plus x minus one on the interval from zero to five. So what is f of zero equal to? f of zero is minus one. What is f of five equal to? It's equal to 25 plus five minus one, that's 29. And between minus one and 29, we choose the number 11. So K is equal to 11. And by the intermediate value theorem, there exists a number C in the interval from zero to five, such that f of c is equal to 11. Let's just draw a picture to see what's going on. So this is a parabola that's going up. f of x equals x squared plus x minus one. One way to 
get the shape of the parabola is to complete the square. This is x squared plus x plus a fourth minus five fourths plus a fourth minus five fourths is minus one. This is x plus a half squared minus five fourths. So this is a parabola with vertex x equal to minus one. The axis of symmetry is the line x equal to minus a half. Uh, the vertex is when x equals minus a um, x plus a half is x equal to minus a half, y equal to minus five fourths. So minus a half is here, minus five fourths is here. This is the point minus a half, minus five fourths. The y intercept is at minus one. When x is one, it has the value one. When x is two, it has the value whatever. So this parabola is going up like this. And somewhere, I mean, this is not drawn to scale. When x is equal to five, the value of the function is 29. At x equals zero, the value of the function is minus one. And somewhere between minus one and 29, we have the horizontal line, y equals 11. And there's some point C where f of C is equal to 11. So we have to find C. We have to solve the equation f of c equals 11 for c between 0 and 5. That means we have to satisfy the solve the equation x squared plus x minus 1 equals 11. That's the same as x squared plus x minus 12 equals 0. This is the same as x plus four, x minus three equals zero. So x is either equal to minus four or x is equal to minus three. This horizontal line crosses the parabola at two points. But we want the point that's between zero and five. Oops, this is plus three. So the solution is this, C is equal to three. The intermediate value theorem says there's a point between zero and five on the x-axis, a point C where F of C is equal to 11. And let's just check. What is F of three? Three squared plus three minus one, nine plus three minus one, 12 minus 1, 11. So it works. <laughs> That's the answer. Professor. Yes. Um, is the 11 hypothetical? Excuse me? The 11, was it a guess number? No, it wasn't a guess. That was a statement of the problem. And the oh. theorem says that for any number between minus 1 and 29, 
for every number k between minus 1 and 29, there's a value of c in the interval from 0 to 5 where f of c equals that number k. For example, choose k equal to 11. Choose any number. I mean, for any number between minus 1 and 29, there's a number c between 0 and 5 where f of c equals that number. So 11 wasn't a guess. It was part of the statement of the problem. OK, thank you. Okay. Section 2.5 is on infinite limits. I actually had the number of one. I should have said at the beginning, this is, um, today we're doing lesson six. and infinite limits. So here's another example, just like the one that I started off discussing today. Suppose we have the function f of x equals three over x minus two which is defined just for all x except 2. At x equal 2, it's not defined. As you approach x equal 2 from the right, so this is the line, the vertical line x equal 2. If x is bigger than 2, x minus 2 is positive. This is going to 0 in the denominator, so this function is going to infinity. So we would say the limit of f of x as x approaches 2 from the right is plus infinity. As you approach x equal 2 from the left, you're going to minus infinity. So the right-handed the right-handed limit the one-sided limit from the right of this function is plus infinity the one-sided limit from the left is minus infinity On the other hand suppose we have a function like f of x equals um 1 over x squared minus 9 Let me do it. Let me look at a different one. One over x minus three squared. So this function is always positive. So this is defined for x different from three, and f of x is strictly greater than zero for all x not equal to three. And for this function, what does the graph look like? Can you move the paper up, please? Yep. So here's the vertical line, x equal 3. And as you approach x equal 3 from the right or the left, this function is always positive. The denominator is going to 0. And the function is going to plus infinity from both sides. So both the right and the left-handed limits of this function as x approaches three are equal to plus infinity. So the limit as x goes to three 
of one over x minus three squared is plus infinity. So in this case, we say that this function has a limit as x approaches three and the limit is equal to infinity. This function does not have a limit as x approaches two. It has a limit from the right and it has a limit from the left. So this has one-sided limits, but not, the, but not simultaneously a left and a right-hand limit. Okay. And now we have the following definition. The vertical line x equals c is a vertical asymptote of the function f of x if the limit of f of x as x approaches c from the right is plus or minus infinity or the limit as x approaches c from the left of f of x is plus or minus infinity. So wherever you have, and whenever you have a point c where the limit of f of x is equal to plus or minus infinity from both sides or from the right or the left, then you have what is called a vertical asymptote. Now in Maple, it's very easy to find vertical asymptotes. For one thing, you can just graph the function and you get a very pretty picture of the graph and there'll be a vertical line wherever there is a vertical asymptote. So, yes. Um, let's look at some examples of finding vertical asymptotes. So we, for all these, we want to find the vertical asymptotes. Suppose we have f of x equals one over two times x plus one. Again, it's clear this function is not defined where the denominator is zero. So this is defined for x not equal to minus one. And the limit of this function as x approaches minus one from the right, if x is bigger than minus one, minus one plus one is positive. If x is less than minus one, for example, minus two, this is negative. So this is going to minus infinity. So we have a vertical asymptote. The line x equal minus one. And again, the graph of this function looks like this. This is the vertical asymptote. This is the line x equal minus one. So for this function, this is the graph and here we have a vertical asymptote. Suppose we have another function, f of x equals x squared plus one over x, minus, over x squared minus one. Again, if you factor the denominator, it's easy to see what's going on. This function is defined everywhere except where the denominator would be zero. So x not equal to one or minus one. What happens as you approach one or minus one? 
Well, the numerator is always positive. The limit as x approaches, let's say, plus 1 from the right, x plus 1 is positive. x is bigger than 1. This is positive. But going to 0, that's infinity. So as you approach 1 from the right, this is going to infinity. What's the limit of f of x as x approaches 1 from the left? If x is less than 1, this is negative, you're going to minus infinity. So we have a vertical asymptote at 1. What's the limit of f of x as x approaches minus 1 from the right? So you approach minus 1. Well, this is going to be negative. This is going to be a negative number minus a negative. This is negative. But if x is less, if x is bigger than minus 1, x plus 1 is positive. So we have positive, positive, negative. This is going to minus infinity. And the limit of f of x as x approaches minus 1 from the left, like minus 2, negative, negative, which is positive, positive. Graph of the function looks like that. So this function goes up to infinity. It looks like this, like this. We have vertical asymptotes. At, pl at plus or minus one. Okay. So this function has two vertical asymptotes, x equal one and x equal minus one. Questions about this? Okay, let's look at another example. F of x equals the cotangent of x. What is the cotangent? Cotangent is cosine over sine. So this is defined whenever sine of x is not zero. And when is x equal to zero, sine of x equal to zero? When x is zero plus or minus pi, plus or minus two pi, plus or minus three pi, and so forth. What does the graph of this function look like for x between zero and pi? The pi over two, That's the cotangent of pi over two. That's the sine, that's the cosine of pi over two over the sine of pi over two. Cosine of pi over two is zero and the sine of pi over two is one. Zero over one is zero. Function is zero. Between zero and pi over two, the cosine and the sine are both positive. The cotangent is positive. But as x approaches 0, this is going to 1 over 0. It's going to plus infinity. When x is between pi over 2 and pi, that's in the second quadrant, the cosine is negative, but the sine is positive. So this is always negative. And the denominator is going to 0. So this is going to minus infinity. So the limit of cotangent of x as x approaches 0 from the right is infinity. The limit of cotangent x as x approaches pi from the left is minus infinity. And this function is periodic. It repeats. With period pi, so at every one of these places where the denominator is zero, this function has infinitely many 
asymptotes. So cotangent x has infinitely many vertical asymptotes. And the vertical asymptotes are the lines x equals zero, pi minus pi, two pi minus two pi, and so forth. All the integer multiples of pi. Now there's a connection between removable discontinuities and finding vertical asymptotes. So here's a nice example. Suppose f of x is the rational function, x squared plus two x minus eight over x squared minus four. So this is only defined where the denominator is not zero, x squared minus four is not zero, which x is not equal to plus or minus two. Everywhere else, this is a perfectly nice function. We can write this function in a simpler form, x squared plus two x minus eight factors into x plus four, x minus two. And x squared minus four factors <coughs> into x plus two, x minus two. So f of x, which is this over this, is x plus four over x minus two over x plus two over x minus two. And for x not equal to two, these cancel. This is x plus four over x plus two. So even though this function is not defined at x equal two, it has a removable singularity. The limit of f of x as x approaches two from the right or the left is two plus four over two plus two or three halves. The limit of f of x as x approaches negative two, well, as x approaches negative two, this is positive and this is positive or negative. I'll just say plus or minus infinity. Well, it's equal to infinity if you're approaching two, if you're approaching negative two from the right and the limit of f of x as you approach negative two from the left like minus three is minus infinity. The graph of this function looks like this. Minus two, zero, two, and so forth. When x is equal to, I just want to find the y-intercept. So f of zero is minus eight over minus four is two. This function looks like this. Here, the vertical line x equal minus two is a vertical asymptote graph of the function looks like this. At x equal to plus two, the function's not defined. There's a hole there, but there's no vertical asymptote. So for this function, it's not defined at plus or minus two, it's discontinuous at those two points. But at x equal plus two, there's a removable singularity. This point is two, three halves. There's no asymptote there. You have the limit from the right and the left as x approaches two. But for x equal negative two, that's not a removable singularity. The limit's 
or go to plus or minus infinity as you approach negative two from the right or the left. And here we have a vertical asymptote. Okay, any questions about infinite limits? Let me pause for a second just to make a note of attendance. I just like to know who is coming to class. It's always interesting. So, I apologize for mispronouncing names. I'm just reading this from the computer screen. Uh, Abdul Rahman Saeed, Angela Thomas, Anthony Calderon, Augusta Garcia, Carlos German, Elijah Atkins, someone that on the screen is the name Eric, but I don't know what Eric's last name is. So Eric, uh, if you would just identify your last name. Oh, okay. Ak oh, there you are. Thank you. Okay, got you. Uh, Eric, good. Um, uh, Elijah Atkins, I got Eric. Isabella M. Isabella M. Must be Marini. Good. Jingwen Kwan, Marlene, Marlene Goulon, Mohammed Manar Osman, Nina Noble, Oscar Garcia. Rachel's iPod, I guess the iPad, I guess that means Rachel Scott. Raphael Goulon. Seymour Shakira. Or sorry, Shakira Seymour. Zakra Khan. Zainab Sizavani. And that's everybody I found. Let's see. In the upcoming exams, do we need to draw graphs as part of the solutions? Yes. Well, you have to answer the question. So if the question is draw a graph, then you have to draw the graph. Um, in general, in mathematics, um, the more pictures you draw, the better. Pictures are good. So, um, And hopefully in your Math 155 class, you're learning how to uh, use the computer. Right. Okay. Actually,
Actually, I keep making a mistake. So um, this is actually lesson seven. So, but that's good because we did review of um, several different things and I like review. So this is really, Lesson number seven. So let me say a little bit about the next section. So it looks like we're up to 10. Someone is asking, are the exams like the homework where you have to scan it into Blackboard? Absolutely, yes. Um, so on the exam, at nine o'clock, I will post the exam on Blackboard and you will have two hours, just like in class, to do the exam. Actually in class, it's an hour and 40 minutes, uh, but you'll have two hours for the extra time involved in converting your handwritten pages to a PDF file and uploading them to Blackboard uh, in the assignment section where it says homework, where it says exam one. So uh, yes, you'll submit your, ho your homework exams exactly, sorry, you'll, ex you'll uh, submit your midterm and final exams exactly the way you submit homework. All right, now, He starts chapter three, section one. And this is on the derivative of a function and tangent lines to a function. So there are two fundamental operations in calculus, the derivative and the integral. And there's a way to describe these things, that's very nice. So let's just recall a straight line. If y equals f of x is a straight line, we often write this in the form mx plus b. The graph looks like this. Here, b is the y-intercept and m is the slope. And what the slope means is, well, this is actually a remarkable fact. If you take any two points on the straight line, so this is say x1, y1, and this is x2, y2. So let me just look at this triangle and blow it up a little bit. So on the line, here we have the point x1, y1. Here we have the point x2, y2. If we draw a vertical line here and a horizontal line there, we get this right triangle. This has x coordinate x1. This has x coordinate x2. The difference from here to here is x2 minus x1. This point has y coordinate y1. This has y coordinate y2. This ratio, this distance from here to here is y2 minus y1. Now, if we were to call this angle theta in this right angle, the tangent of theta is this over this, opposite over adjacent. And that's exactly the number m in the equation of the straight line. m is, what is, is the slope. So on a straight line, if you take two points, any two points, and you look at the rise over the run, so y2 minus y1, this is sometimes called the rise. As you go from this point to this point, the rise in the height of the function is from here to here. 
it can be negative, it could be a decline, but it's still called the rise. From here to here, this number is called the run. So some people like to think of the slope as rise over run. And what we want to do is try to generalize this from straight lines to curves. So suppose we have a function y equals f of x, and the graph, let's say, looks like that. And what we want to do is to somehow figure out something like a tangent to the curve at a point. So let's say this is A, or let's call it C. So this point on the curve, so this is, is C comma F of C. And we wanna figure out what is like the best possible line we could draw, which is something like a tangent to the curve at this point. And the idea is as follows. Let me just sort of blow this up a little bit. Suppose this is the point C F of C. So on the X axis, this is C. And suppose I move a little bit to the right. So this is C plus something. And we call write it as this triangle X. So delta, this is the Greek capital letter delta. There's also a lowercase delta, which looks like this. This is the Greek lowercase delta. But the classical notation is to use this capital delta X to indicate it's just a small number. So this point on the curve, this is C plus delta X, that's the X coordinate. And then we evaluate the function at C plus delta X. And through these two points, we can draw a line. This line is called a secant line. So let me just blow that up a little bit. Let's say this is C and this is C plus delta X. So I have these two points on the curve. This is all part of the curve y equals f of x. And I draw a straight line between those two points. This point has coordinates c f of c, and this point has coordinates c plus delta x, f of c plus delta x. What is the slope of the secant line? Well, it's rise over run. It's f of c plus delta x minus f of c over c plus delta x minus c. In the denominator, the c's cancel. This is f of c plus delta x minus f of c over delta x delta x different from zero, positive or negative, but different from zero. So we have a curve, y equals f of x, fix a point c, fix a point c plus delta x, not too far away, draw the tangent, the secant line between these two points on the curve and find the slope of that line. Right. Now, 
if we took a smaller value of delta x, we get another tangent line. And if we took an even smaller value of delta x, we get another tangent line. And as you take delta x going to zero, so you're taking the secant lines between points on the curve, this point is fixed and the other point is getting closer and closer. It may happen that these secant lines geometrically approach a limit and that limit is called the tangent line. So, the slope of the tangent line to the curve y equals f of x at x equals c is the limit of the slopes of the secant lines through the two points C f of C and C plus delta x, f of C plus delta x, if the limit exists. So we know in calculus, limits sometimes exist, but they don't always exist. And if the limit exists, that's what we call the slope with the tangent. So let's look at a nice example. So consider the parabola f of x equals x squared plus one. Suppose we want to find, if it exists, the slope of the tangent line at a point C f of C on the parabola, on the curve. So here's C and f of C is C squared plus one. And here we have a C plus delta X, an F of C plus delta X, which is C plus delta X, C plus delta X squared plus one. So what is the slope of the secant? It's F of C plus delta X minus F of C over delta X. Let me just write this over here. This equals C plus delta X squared plus one minus C squared plus one over delta X. When you expand this out, this is C squared plus two C delta X plus delta X squared plus one minus C squared minus one over delta X. And we have some cancellation. C squared minus C squared cancels. Plus one minus one cancels. And we're left with just these two terms. Two C delta X plus delta X squared over delta X. You can cancel a delta X, you get two C plus delta X. So f of c plus delta x minus f of c 
over delta x is equal to 2c plus delta x. And if you take the limit as delta x goes to zero, that's the limit of this, delta x goes to zero, that's just 2c. So remember f of x is the parabola x squared plus one. That's the graph of the parabola. For example, when x is equal to one, this is the point one comma two. So the slope of the tangent line at the point one comma two is, so this is the case c equal one, two c is equal to two. So the tangent line has slope two. So what can we say about the tangent line? So the tangent line to the parabola y equals x squared plus one at the point one comma two has slope two. What does the point slope formula say? Point slope formula says the line through a point A, B with slope M is y equals m x minus a plus b. So this is the point slope formula, which you absolutely positively must know. So what is the tangent line? The point a, b is one, two. So a is one, b is two. The slope is two. So the tangent line is y equals two x minus one plus two, two x minus two plus two, y equals two x. That's the slope of the tangent line. So everything we're doing today, the review and this new part, be beginning our study of the derivative is very important. And understanding this concept of finding a tangent line to a curve at a point as a limit of secant lines leads to the following definition of the derivative. So let f prime of x denote the derivative of the function y equals f of x So f prime of x is defined as follows at any point x it's the limit of this quotient f of x plus delta x minus f of x divided by delta x as delta x goes to zero if it if the limit exists limits don't always exist and again the picture is the following here's the point on the curve x f of x 
you move a little bit to the left or the right, x plus delta x, f of x plus delta x, draw this line, the secant line, this is the slope. So this line has slope exactly f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x rise over one. So this is what we're going to spend the next two months studying, the derivative. There are other notations for the derivative and we use them all. f prime of x dy dx derivative of f of x dx capital D of y. Well, these are the basic ones that the book is going to use. Sometimes we write delta y to be f of x plus delta x minus f of x. And then dy dx would be the limit as delta x goes to zero of delta y over delta x. So these are all different notations for the derivatives. And you have to become familiar with them. So this is really the most important thing we do for half, actually two thirds of the course, is studying the derivatives. So. Yeah. Any questions about this? All right. So this is a lot to digest. And um, so I think we're going to stop right now and we will continue on Wednesday. But I encourage you to do problems, 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 as many problems as you can. It's really the only way to learn calculus. Okay. All right. Questions before we go? Okay, then we are done for today. I will, we will be back Wednesday at nine o'clock.